Back injuries, head injuries, they're pretty much all the same, right? We'll get into that this week on Drippin' Sports. What's up, everybody? Another week. We are in October. We have made it through the first month of the NFL and NCAA season, and that means it is Drippin' Sports with the Iceman. And as always, flub the intro again, we have the coach, and we have a special guest who I'm going to let the coach introduce. So, Coach, how you doing, buddy? Matty Ice, doing well. Coming off a very interesting weekend of football. I tell you what, there never seems to be a shortage of controversy, controversies and storylines, which I'm sure we'll get into. But no, good weekend, had another soccer game, came out again with a 2-2 tie. But hey, I take it, we're still without a loss, so uh, I'm happy about that. Uh, I got to, We got a little practice on Thursday, hopefully can iron out a few of our mistakes and I can lead the troops to victory on Saturday morning. I have to ask, was the goalie picking grass again? Is that what caused the tie? Or is- okay, so let me explain this to you real quick. So I don't know how familiar you are with soccer at all right but so if the goal gets kicked or if the ball gets kicked out of bounds beyond the end line by the offensive team it's a goal kick so you set the ball like on the corner of the little box and the goalie kicks it Mm -hmm. well of course these young kids they're they are all like crowded around just in the front like right at the box waiting for the ball so i've been telling the goalies i'm like kick the ball to the outside like kick it to the sideline either way i don't care i kick it to the sideline not to the center of the field Ball gets put there. The youngster who's playing goalie, as I'm screaming, kick it to the outside. Kick it to the... I have all of our team to the outside. That's where I've directed them to. And he kicks it straight ahead. Another kick from the other team kicks it. Goes like one inch outside the goal post, out of bounds. Another goal kick. Ball gets put in place. Hey, buddy, out here. Kick it at me. Over here. All right, what's he do? Kicks it straight ahead. Ball gets kicked. Bounces off the post. Kicked again. Out of bounds. Another goal kick. So third time's a charm. Okay, he's figured it out now, right? Two close calls in a row. Nope. This one's the most softball one of them all. Like soft kick straight ahead. Kick kid from the other team straight in the net. Tie game. (laughs) And there's probably like two minutes left in the game at this point. We're ahead two to one. I felt bad because the disappointment on my face was probably impossible to hide. So then at that point in time, he has an untied shoe and comes over. And so I'm tying his shoe and trying to be like, hey, buddy, did you hear me over here saying kick the ball to the outside? You see what happens. And at that about that time, the referee says, oh, game over. (laughs) I turn around and his mother happened to be the one that was bringing treats for the team. And she's like sitting. She's like five feet behind me. And she's like, yeah, I guess we need to practice on that one. You know, I mean, she realize what happened but when i first saw her i'm like oh crap she's gonna like tell me i'm an asshole or something we still though i'll take the tie definitely better than a loss but uh, en- enough about youth soccer got my cousin alex in here today baseball connoisseur with the playoffs upon us alex how are you i'm doing good brad good to be here awesome man so matty ice with no further ado Let's get into it, unless you have any great stories to tell from the weekend. No, Alex, your intro was so tepid that it reminded me of Major League Two when Harry Doyle got so drunk that he passed out and his partner said, fly ball, caught. And that was his commentary for the game. So uh, congrats to you for coming in hot, but I do appreciate you coming here. And we are going to (laughs) talk a little bit of baseball, but I want to cop, I think, to something that we missed last week. And it was an intentional miss on my part and on Brad's part. And we did not talk about a a situation that had happened the previous Sunday during the NFL action because, quite frankly, I don't think we knew enough about it. And I just kind of left it off of our our plate. And what happened on the Thursday night football game, now, if you watch that game, I think every single person, unless you live in Cincinnati, is remembering one thing about that game. And it was the way that Tua looked after a pretty, what seemed like brutal hit, but a pretty normal hit in the NFL. I mean, we see these kinds of hits all the time. The quarterback gets flung around, head hits the turf. And Tua is sitting there on the ground, not moving. His hands look devastatingly crimped, like crimped in front of his face. And I know for me, I've seen that in the boxing ring. I've seen guys get knocked out, and that's what happens. You go cold, you go limp. The debate now has been about everything surrounding not just this past Thursday, but the previous Sunday. And I know that I have very strong thoughts about this. 
And I want to get into it with you guys because I think that we owe the listeners that. And I think that it has been a hot topic. We're obviously piling on to something that's already there. But, you know, Coach, from your experience as a coach, I want to hear it from you, how you kind of experienced the first Sunday, seeing what happened in primetime on Thursday, and now hearing all the commentary that has happened from Tua, from the coaches, from the organization, and so forth. So it's it's interesting because I, I have a little bit of history um, in this department, not just as a coach, but as a player. I suffered a concussion my junior year of high school, uh, and I had to miss. I missed most of the season as a result. But I, I remember there being like a – and then they were, this is back. We're talking 2003. And I remember there being a vibe of like you need to just like get over it and play, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. Like just being made to feel like – you know, not, you know, obviously it was in my head, but that it, it was like this fictitious injury that didn't really exist. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I ended up getting my bell rung, rung again my senior year. And I, luckily enough, the way it happened, I only had to miss like practice for a few days or something. But it's like they say, once you get one, you're more susceptible mm -hmm. for another. And then as I got into coaching, it, you know, it over the years, it became more and more serious, more and more a point of emphasis. And it became a required part of coaching education at the high school level. And even when I coached uh, junior high wrestling and even kids club wrestling, where you had to pass a concussion test to recognize, you know, and a lot of it's common sense stuff. You would, you know, you would think, and I imagine there's some li liability things that are tied to why they make you take this test. So they can say, well, hey, we, we, you know, they took this test. They were qualified if something terrible would ever happen in relation to Tua. After seeing the way he reacted to everything last week, two weeks ago, whatever you want to call it, with getting up and stumbling around, I, he should have never returned to that game. And the fact that he walked out there four days later and started seems like a catastrophic failure on the NFL. I'm not even going to blame the Dolphins because if you think for a moment that the NFL disagreed with if, if the nfl disagreed with putting Tua on the field on thursday he would not have been on the field yes right um, the only reason he was on the field on thursday is because the nfl did not have a problem with him being on the field on thursday i agree this is a this is a nfl issue we can sit there all day long and blame the, the dolphin staff and everyone else but this is an nfl issue and even mike mcdaniel said you know he was hey there's an independent neurologist you know that, that is expertly trained in this that signed off on him playing in that game you know i am not qualified to make that decision now yes maybe that's him passing the buck because i'm not i'm not a doctor either but i know what it looks like when somebody shouldn't be on the football field and i'm qualified to say that like hey i don't you're not playing and as the head coach, he, he could say, hey, you're not playing. But in the world we live in, Tua doesn't play. They get blown out, which they lost anyways. But Tua doesn't play. They get blown out. And they say, well, he was cleared to play, but the coach wouldn't play him. You know, and that becomes a narrative, sadly. No, it's, it's an NFL problem. I don't know. This, this is ugly, man. I, I really don't know that this is going to go away anytime soon. I don't I don't think they're going to be able to sweep this one under the rug. I expect there to be some pretty significant a pretty significant reaction to this in some way. Now, I just want to say this, that the NFL, who has been about optics at just about every turn, every single situation that has come up from Colin Kaepernick to the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson's boob, all that stuff, they're all about optics. They want to make sure that they look as good as possible in just about every scenario. And when we are seeing Tua get up on a Sunday and stumble the way that he stumbled, Yes, we're not doctors, we're not neurologists, nobody watching football is, but most of us can look at a reaction to something and say to ourselves, he probably shouldn't go back out there. I know that there's independent neurologists, but I do feel that at the end of the day, the culture of winning wins out above all of that kind of stuff because the independent neurologist, apparently, unless they say he can't go out there, the team can still make the choice to not put him out there. And I think what kills me about it is that, yes, the NFL is culpable in this 100%, but I want better from the Miami Dolphins. I understand that they haven't won anything in a very long time and they are thirsting to reach that mountaintop. But a game in week three or week four, when there are 17 games on the slate and you know that you're gonna have to win a lot of tough games later on, and knowing that possibly put him putting him in there five days after, that's the other thing too. It wasn't like they were on a bye and they had a 10 week separation between games. They should have not played him on Thursday, given him that 10 week, ten days off, and they would have been able to at least better defend themselves from putting him in there. But five days later, 
for a game that they really didn't need. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be other games that are going to be important. And I just feel like everybody let Tua down, including Tua himself, because I'm sure he wanted to go back in there on Sunday. But you can attest to this. And anybody listening who is a coach, you have a responsibility to make sure you protect your players from themselves because players are always want to going to go back out there, especially at the professional level. And I feel like Mike McDaniel is too new in this job to be able to say anything otherwise. But I want to bring this back to Brian Flores because now that I see the way that the organization works and I see that the way that Mike McDaniel, whether he's passing the buck or not, isn't willing to protect Tua in a way that says, hey, we don't need him out there. I think Brian Flores actually got fired because he was willing to say to Dolphins executives, I'm not doing what you're asking me to do because it's just morally not right. And that's what I want to see from Mike McDaniel going forward after this. I hope that Tua doesn't play for the next couple weeks. He's not playing this week. My God, if he was playing this week, I'm, I don't even know what the backlash would be. So it makes sense that he's not playing. But I want them to be safe with Tua because if this is their franchise guy, they got to think beyond this season and honestly for Tua's health in life long term. No, I agree. And for me, it's more so the fact that the league, you know, they they sit there and they roll out all the time like a billboard, you know, player safety, player safety. I mean, look at the flags that get thrown on some of these hits on the quarterback, right? I mean, it's obvious sometimes that that there's the uh, player safety, an emphasis on player safety or at least certain player safety. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a person where I'm like, don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. Mm -hmm. Like, I would rather you say, I, I would much rather the NFL come out and say, hey, listen, this is football. People are going to get hurt. People are, might suffer injuries. They're going to impact them for the rest of their lives. But this is the game of football, and this is how we're going to operate. I would much rather them at least own what they're doing than to sit there and to, to tell me that you have this emphasis on player safety and blah, 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 blah. They don't. Like, I, I can tolerate almost any behavior from a person if you're willing to just own it and just say, yeah, this is, uh, I'm an asshole, <laughs> whatever, like deal with it. Like I, I'm totally cool with that. You know, Alex, did you, I don't know kind of uh, how familiar you are with, with this sort of side of things, but you know, just the whole head injury thing in general. My question is, has anything happened like this before to the, of this magnitude in the NFL? Cause I don't, as a casual NFL fan, I get a lot of my news from the talking heads and, Rant and overzealous fans on Twitter, as most people do. And I haven't really heard of anything like this in the past. And I've been hearing about this a lot this past week. So has anything happened like this before? Where like safety is coming to question or keeping a player playing through this kind of thing is coming to question? Or what can you say about that? Oh, I can tell you, Alex, that uh, there has been a, a trend in football that has lent itself to rub some dirt on it to what Brad is talking about, play through a lot of things. It wasn't until the late 90s where scientists actually started getting involved to tell the NFL there was a correlation between head trauma and brain damage down the line. And the more time that went by and the less that the NFL did, the more the data became better. And it wasn't until 10 years ago. That's the other thing I think you want to keep in mind here is that the concussion protocols that are in place now feel commonplace. They're only 10 years old. The NFL celebrated its 100th season a couple of seasons ago. So that means there were about 90 seasons prior to in which the players just had to go out there and play through anything. There was a lawsuit against the NFL for a lot of the old players. I believe Mike Dicka was a part of it. Basically, a lot of those players from the 60s, 70s have no quality of life because there were no safety protocols whatsoever. And to be fair to the NFL, we didn't really know a whole lot. But I think morally we cut some corners and so there is a precedent of this and that's what makes this so egregious to me is that we're going backwards we're supposedly supposed to have learned a whole lot but clearly we haven't i'll tell you to, to put a little uh, a silver lining on this kind of heavy story i'm happy with society's reaction because like you said 10 years ago society would have been like man what a softy man Tua, mm -hmm. he's not cut out to play this game he's weak i mean it would have been a totally different narrative and I, i'm happy that society is intelligent enough to call out the nfl to call out you know this issue for what it is and and kind of alex to to answer your question more specifically there hasn't been a situation as maybe egregious 
as this, uh, at least in recent memory, where you had a player like stumbling, and then the next week they just roll. Days later, they roll him out there, and then he goes down and has you know sort of the reaction and suffers you know a worse injury uh, where it could have been prevented. This is definitely, I think, the first time, at least in my memory, that there's been something so significant. And and I think too, what aided the spotlight is it was a standalone game on Thursday night where. Any, I mean, probably, you know, five, six, ten times the amount of people were watching the game that would, then would have been watching it if it was at noon on Sunday. Theoretically, it is a Thursday night game, so a lot of people... Oh, I, man, you're such a hater. Well, hold on. Let, let, football. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it. you that I did not actually tune in until after Tua's injury. We were doing something else and watching something else, and I was on the couch and said, oh, shit, I forgot about Thursday night football because I've conditioned myself to not watch because historically the matchups have been bad. I do agree with you on that, Brad. Now, some of that has to do with the fact that we in society are all about virtue signaling. So it's cool now to point out that stuff and be out in front of it and say, hey, look at this, this is wrong. When the people, most of them saying that it's wrong have no effing clue why it's wrong. They're just with everybody else, the mass mob. This is wrong, this is wrong, but it was bad. But Alex, I wanna transition to something. This is why we brought you here. And speaking of sports that always get it right, Major League Baseball, always getting it right. At every turn, fans are going in droves to these games. The viewership is getting younger. But we did have a really cool moment with the playoffs starting on Friday, and you're a huge Cardinal fan. And the Cardinals did something really, really cool, and they gave what I call the Cardinal lifers. Yadi Molina, Albert Pujols, who just hit his 703rd home run, which like defies logic. It's just the craziest thing. And I believe Adam Wainwright all got what I consider a curtain call in what has to be their last game playing together. And they're going to be in the playoffs and they're going to have a shot here. But I wanted to get your fan perspective on how you felt about the season in that moment and everything surrounding Albert Pujols right now. So at least for as far as the Cardinal season got, has gone, it's it's had a lot of up and ups and downs. It usually does every year with them. They've never, at least in the past 10 years or so, they've hardly ran away with any of the seasons they've gone in the playoffs. And really, what's kind of saved the optics of the season when they've been down is having those guys like Pujols and Molina in their last year. And Wainwright, who hasn't, I don't want to say anything, but he hasn't said anything about retiring yet. But those three guys are a part of my childhood and how I grew to love the game of baseball and to see them finally leaving. Kind of bittersweet, but at least they're all performing well on their way out. Pujols has... He's listed at 42. He's probably like, I don't know, 47, something like that. But he's he's hitting like he did when he was with St. Louis. Like you look at those years he was with the Angels and he looked like the shell of what he shell of what he was. He was released last year at the tail end of that contract and everyone was like, oh, he's done. He's never going to play again. Is this really how he's going to go out? And then this past offseason, they signed him to a cheap deal having the designated hitter in both leagues again so it gave him an opportunity for ample playing time and he's made the most of it and he's really just looked like old poo holes it's been great to see it really has but you just made me feel ancient because you said these guys were my childhood and albert poo holes came into the league when i was a senior in high school actually i think i might have been a freshman in college 2001 and hit the home run that he hit off brad lidge in the playoffs was like a billion years ago it's funny you say that because as Alex was describing that, I was kind of, or maybe as you were even like teeing them up, I'm thinking, I'm like, this has been, you know, pretty much your your life as far as when, when you've known what's going on. Like your life as a Cardinals fan is almost entirely included these three guys. Yeah, 100%. My, my first real baseball memory was probably in the 2006 World Series and seeing Adam Wainwright close out the World Series, throw that final strike to Yadier Molina, and they're hugging each other and just those, and now they've been here 17 years later, still doing the same thing. Just come all this way. How old were you in 2006? Don't say it. <laughs> I was eight years old in 2006. 2006, I had just moved here having graduated from college. So that's where we are here. I think I'm the oldest one in the group right here by a pretty significant margin. You can't be that much older than I am. I'm going to turn 40 in February. Oh, so you're three, three-ish years older than me. So Alex, the other thing I want to ask you about before we move on, and I, I mean, this is an in-depth discussion or it could be. So obviously I grew up watching baseball in a very different time and you have been watching baseball where analytics have really been driving the evolution of the game. And some would say it's a de-evolution of the game. I'm kind of not a hater on analytics because I'm a statistician in my real job, but I do see that the 
the type of game that is being played now and the approach of hitters at the plate and all that has changed drastically. That coupled with the fact that just about every guy coming out of the bullpen throws 100 miles an hour. I don't know if you remember this, but they used to cut away to Araldis Chapman throwing 100 because he was literally the only guy in the league doing it. And now every bullpen is filled with guys who can do that. And the games have gotten longer and there is less balls put in play every single year. That record continues to be broken. I don't know if the streak has been broken recently, but I do know for a very long stretch of time, balls in play was down and home runs are up. But you see a lot of these guys who are hitting like 230. I call them the Joey Gallows. They're hitting like 230 with 40 homers and 80, 80 RBIs or something. What do you think about the way that the game is today? Because I think that if they don't figure out a way to either shorten the games or get people's attention back on baseball, that it's going to be very, very difficult as football continues to have a stranglehold on the American consumer. I mean, I am, I've always been a stats guy. Even when I was little, all these baseball video games, you just look at all the stats of all the players, all the baseball cards and stuff. So analytics, I've kind of grown into the threshold of that because I've been able to see the evolution of that and I pretty much grew up with it. I don't think it's a, a stain on the game at all in any ways because you have enough stats and something, you're going to find out how to really simplify and really make, make the game more efficient. So there you have the three true outcomes with the home run, the walk, and the strikeout, which has kind of been the trend here the past five, ten years. But I don't think it's really a bad thing. I just think that you're always going to have, if you look historically, you've always had your homer guys that will strike out, and you've always had your... Freddie Freeman that's going to hit 330 and hit 40 doubles but not be a big power guy like the the game has changed but it's always going to have its roots and I just think that it's going to be okay baseball has always been a more regional kind of sport anyway I don't think it's really going to get less popular so I wonder what you think then about like when you when I hear you describe the game it, it makes it sound to me like you took a classic car like a 60 whatever Mustang and put like a, a modern fuel efficient motor in it. You know what I mean? Like, like it's still, it's still its roots. It still looks like it always did somewhat, but it gets 25 miles to the gallon type of thing. And I'm kind of curious how you look at, you know, are you in favor? Do you like things like the shift? Um, what are your thoughts on like the pitch clock and, and some of these things are trying to do to the game to speed it up or even make it more offense friendly because you know lately frankly uh, with all the strikeouts yeah we get home runs but there's also a lot of strikeouts that necessarily hasn't been see the way i see things is the pitcher always has an innate advantage over the batter they have all the data they have all the mechanics they can uh like uh matt was saying he um guys are throwing harder than ever and that's just that's part of the technique now and then recently they had to crack down on sticky stuff, spider tack. So they were throwing harder than ever. The ball was moving more than ever with all the spin rate and everything that's come out, which is just more data. Like that's all they have now is just more data. So I think the shift, I don't, I honestly, I like the shift because, you know, oh, I just hit it the other way. Uh, that's why you're getting paid millions of dollars a year to hit it the other way. When really... That, that might have worked when the average pitcher was throwing like 90 miles an hour 15, 20 years ago. But you try squaring up a, a Roldis Chapman 102 mile an hour fastball that's moving all over the place and take that the other way. Like it's not as easy as it sounds. And you got the old people out there that grew up in the 80s thinking, oh, all these guys hit with contact. What's weird to me, though, is it doesn't sound like it would be hard to be late on a 100 mile an hour fastball, right? It's hard to say, really. I mean... All the guys that are hitting 100 mile an hour fastball are taking 450 to dead center. You don't see them like hitting them down the line. Well, usually when they're late, they're too late, right? And it's foul or or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, well, so much of the strategy at the plate is to try and guess, and it's really trying to to think about the counts. I mean, analytics is not just for the managers and the coaches who are making decisions. It's really for the players too, because when you go up there and it's like, okay, it's 0 and 1, and you've you've watched tape on a guy that you you know may or may not have faced before. And you're trying to figure out what they're going to what they're going to throw. And usually, Brad, what you see is uh, he's looking off speed, and you get the hundred mile an hour cheese, and then you got him, you know, dead to rights, or the opposite, right? They're looking for speed, and they get off speed. But I think the other thing that is is key to the, all of this, Brad, too, is that p p part of the evolution of the game has become economically because the reason why pitchers are throwing this hard, and, and Alex, you talked about a technique, and then hitters, they're looking at launch angle, right? Exit velocity, things like of that nature. 
because that's what's getting paid. That's what the executives are paying for. And so that's how the evolution of the game takes place because hitters are not going to continue to do this if they're not going to get paid to do it. So like, it's, it's such a fascinating thing to me, but Alex, I'm not saying that analytics are a bad thing or a stain on the sport or anything, but obviously when you're talking about keeping your casual viewer, which is something that baseball has a difficult time doing, 162 games, it's hard to sell game number 99 and how important it is and all that. Whereas the NFL, you have 17 games once a week and for every single husband out there, it's very easy to ask your wife for one day a week as opposed to, hey, I've got to watch this series of three games in a row and they're not really meaningful because it's May and all that kind of stuff. I just wanted to hear it from your perspective because I too love stats and that's what made baseball so great. It's just, it becomes difficult to watch in the playoffs because man, these games start so late and they end so damn late. There's nothing better though than playoff baseball. It's almost like, I, I hate, I, I'm gonna, I'm kicking myself for making this analogy. But playoff baseball, it, it's almost like the NBA. It's the, it's almost the only part. I want to say it's almost the only watchable part of the season, which is not true because I, I do like baseball. I, I like the beauty of baseball, but it, it's the most exciting time to watch it. Just like playoff time is the most exciting time to watch the NBA because they actually play defense. And that's honestly, you could kind of correlate that to baseball. It's like once playoff baseball comes around, it's almost like they play by a different set of rules. Now small ball is way more relevant. You see you see a lot more strategy. Um, the kind of baseball we all would like to see every game, but like you said, there's not every game isn't played with the same stakes throughout the year. You know, a game in June, even though it's it's relevant, right? Because one game could make the difference, but a random game in June isn't played with the same attention to detail that a game is played with in October. And there's a lot to manage too in that regard, you know, because you have a roster. And then of course, once you get to the playoffs, you've weeded it out. And you have the best of the best. Whereas in the NBA, you know, when the, the Orlando Magic play the Golden State Warriors, like who cares? It doesn't really matter. They're probably going to sit their starters a lot because, hey, this is a rest game for us. It doesn't really matter to us. But uh, go ahead, Alex. Now, see, the 162 game season I like because it really it shows like the, the length of your roster. It shows the depth of your minor league system to be able to bring up guys and maybe have a rookie make a debut here and there if someone's injured. At the end of that grind, you're with the ones that earned it. And then in playoff baseball, I think that's where the managers make their money. Like the managers don't make their money in June or May because realistically, a lot of the managers are getting lineups and roster handed down to them by an analytics department that's never set foot on a baseball field. They're giving them the most math, giving them the most mathematically correct lineup on that day against that pitcher. But in the playoffs, the manager's making the decisions. They're doing the small ball. It's that's that's where it's really old school baseball. And the biggest evolution, Brad, is the fact that starters used to be given the benefit of the doubt, even in the playoffs. Like if you had your workhorse, a guy like Kurt Schilling, let's say, you're gonna let him get through a jam. But in today's world where you have all these guys throwing major gas in your bullpen with movement, there's no need, right? And maybe the old school part of me wishes that wasn't the case because I used to love when you had the ace out there, but it's just the way that the game is played today. And no matter how much I don't like it aesthetically, it does make sense from a strategy perspective. No, and that's where all the great stories in baseball come from, right? They're, they're, you don't hear, uh, if Kurt Schilling throws the game with the bloody sock in May, you never hear about it, right? You know, these, you know, you have these guys that are like enshrined in, in folklore, spo sports folklore, right? Because of these crazy accomplishments in the playoffs like you know david freeze for the cardinals you know like you know people like that who almost really their career beyond that moment has been pretty pedestrian but they're going to be ingrained and in, you know he's going to be ingrained in cardinals fans memories forever they're going to know where they were when that happened type of thing alex was in the womb when that happened probably so <laughs> this is monumental moments and that's that's really the great part about baseball is it it is uh there is something kind of romantic about baseball that, that i think everybody that any red-blooded american gets a little like mushy about when you when you kind of get down to it which is awesome well we just had a solid 20 minutes of baseball talk it's the first time it's ever happened on this show so we're going to move on a little bit, but Alex, we will get back to baseball. So I appreciate your insight on that. And of course, I think we have the playoffs coming up. So we'll have more opportunities if you ever want to stop by and, and chat about what's going on in the game. But let's move on to the NFL. And this weekend was you know, kind of OK. I think that we have we've reached a point now where we seem to have some OK games and we're kind of waiting for for games to be exciting. But to me, the couple of games that stand out, Bills and Ravens, 
I did say that the Ravens were going to win this game, and at the end of the first half, they looked amazing, and then the Bills showed me that they are a great team by coming back, but I think one thing in that game stood out to me was at the end of the game, tied at 20, fourth down and goal, I think it was from like the two-yard line, and John Harbaugh decided to go for it, and they didn't get it, and at the time, I thought to myself they should have taken the points and given the ball back to the Bills and protected a lead, but he has been adamant that they didn't want to do that. They wanted to score, they wanted to get in and really put the pressure on the Bills, so Brad, I wanted to hear from your perspective how you would have handled that situation just from uh, afar as a fan there's there's two words two words one name two words that describes why they didn't kick a field goal that's josh allen probably honestly the best active quarterback currently in the nfl i would not want to give the ball back to josh allen there's other guys that have been that type of guy too tom brady Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, you know, there, there's a short list, but there's guys that like, you're like, no lead is good enough. Um, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like the, uh, the walking, uh, not to go back to baseball, but sort of like walking a guy with the bases loaded type of scenario. And I, I can't blame John Harbaugh. He's a, he's a really good coach. I, I tend to be a little on the conservative side when it comes to coaching. I think I would have taken the points and rolled the dice but I totally understand why he did it. I think the other name too is Lamar Jackson. I mean, you got the most dynamic player in the league. You'd like to think that he could get two yards for you or make something happen. But the Bills get a huge win. They get their moxie back after losing that game to the Dolphins. And I said last week, I was more impressed with them in the loss. And I think that they are clearly the best team in the AFC or, or close to it. I don't think there's that much competition there, but Brad, I have a fundamental question for you. Who is the coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars? Oh my gosh again it's the 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 no i the guy that was the coach of the the freaking eagles man right doug peterson yeah your boy doug, doug peterson. peterson so jags traveled to philadelphia it was a slop fest because hurricane ian hit up here so there was a ton of rain and the jags came out playing for you buddy doug peterson was out there 14 nothing lead the twitter universe was eagles are frauds jags are here and by the time we got to the end of the third quarter the eagles had taken over the game the jags couldn't get a first down eagles end up improving to 4-0 they're the only undefeated team in the league now and the the jags kind of get that okay you know welcome to the nfl moment you're not quite here yet uh, i think the eagles this is a tough game for them being down 14 a lot of adversity I like to see this from a team like the Eagles, who I've been a little bit questionable of. And again, we're getting more of a sample size where it seems like, okay, we might be able to chalk the Eagles up to being a good team. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously a talented team. To win four game, four consecutive games in the NFL, whether it's your first four, next four, last four, is impressive. But I, I, I'm not sold on their schedule. Now, I know I'm, I'm number one Detroit Lions fan right here, my Detroit Lions, but... You snuck by the Lions. You know, you, yes, you beat the Vikings, who everyone thinks are going to be pretty good this year. Then you've beaten the Commanders and the young, maybe up and coming Jags. And now you're going to go play the Cardinals, who uh, that's another question mark team. And, and then you got the Cowboys, who nobody sold. And then the Steelers and the Texans and the Commanders again, then the Colts. I mean, this is not a great, I mean, they could realistically, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine and oh, 10 and oh is not impossible based off their schedule and then they play the packers but even beyond that packers titans giants bears cowboys saints giants this is not a strong schedule at all i would at the, with the seeing their schedule i expect them to have a, a very strong record i mean they honestly stand a very good chance with that schedule of being the number one seed in the nfc and, and then again, it wouldn't surprise me if come playoff time, they get knocked off early because just because of the schedule, because you're going to have a, a, some more, some more veteran, well-coached teams in that playoff field, the Packers, the Rams, people like that, that you're going to have to deal with. And, you know, you're not seeing anybody like that. You know, yeah, I, what I say, yeah, maybe they play the Packers here, but I, I mean, Packers, you know, if you have to play the Packers in the playoffs, that's a totally different story. Yeah, just play them with your third string quarterback. It'll be totally fine. <laughs> the thing about the Eagles, though, and this is my hot take for the week, is they look like the perfect team to lose a first round game after a bye or a first round bye at home. Um, they, they look like that kind of a team, like the Titans last year. I totally got that wrong, but I think everybody gets the idea. I completely agree man speaking of another team that looks like they're gonna lose in the first round of the playoffs that was the tampa bay bucks they get absolutely steamrolled at home by the chiefs pat mahomes is ridiculous the chiefs seem to have tapped a fountain of youth in on offense after losing tyreek hill 
And Mahomes just had one of those Mahomes games. You could not stop him. He's mobile in the pocket. And he had that stupid flip pass at like the one yard line for a touchdown that no quarterback coach in the entire world would tell you that that was a good idea. And I always love Pat Mahomes because I know that high school coaches everywhere have a tape on him and it says, let's watch this. None of you ever do any of this. No, I, we talked about that. What last week, Brett Favre, right? He's the, he is the, he's, he's way more talented than Brett Favre ever was like athletically, yes. but he does a lot of the same things. He does things that you, you can't teach and you would never teach. The only way he get the only reason he gets away with it is because of how athletically talented he is. Um, again, to make a baseball reference, you see these guys that go up there in these goofy ass batting stances and they hold the bat on all these crazy places. But if you watch that image in slow motion when they swing, everybody comes to this. No matter where that bat starts, everybody comes to the same exact position before they bring that bat through the through the zone. Why you have all that extra bullshit? Who who was the guy? with the brewers is that shook the bat over his head oh, Craig, yeah. Council. Yep. Craig council yep. yeah. yeah and you, you got the those guys of the world but no i mean you would never like you said you would never teach somebody to do that high school coaches everywhere are probably like hey, you see what this guy's doing never do it like you said the bucks man uh, ugh, i just i don't i got a bad feeling about that team and the only thing they have going for them is that division is garbage. Oh, yeah, it's garbage. And they're going to make the playoffs. And that's the thing is they're going to make the playoffs and play some team that's an up and coming team, like maybe the 49ers, depending on what happens there. And they're going to lose because I just do not see them as a strong team right now. Brady is throwing to literally nobody except for Mike Evans. And the defense can't stop anybody. It's just it seems like it's a veritable shit show right now. The NFC as a whole is yeah. just a dumpster fire. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent. Like agree. if you could, like you say, if you could take the AFC South and just multiply it by four, you have the NFC. Yes. By the way, I'm going to advocate for the three of us to do a top five best batting stances in Major League Baseball history one day. We will do that because there are some really, really great ones out there. Backup quarterbacks ruled the have seemingly ruled the day recently. Cooper Rush made game 3-0. and Apparently, he's the first Cowboys quarterback to start his career 4-0, which is a, such a bullshit stat. Uh, the Patriots nearly take out Rodgers at, at Lambeau with, let me get this right, Bailey Zappi. That's right, third-string quarterback that everybody in New England had to look up because nobody knew who he was. And I think the biggest news of the weekend was Kenny Pickett overtaking Mitch Trubisky finally. And it seems like even though he threw three picks, he's going he's gonna to be the quarterback of the future. He is number one in the depth chart now. Yeah, so if you're the Steelers, you had to move on from Mitch Trubisky, especially with Kenny Pickett being a pit guy. It, you were just going to, the, the, the roars for him, the calls for him were just going to keep getting louder and louder. Obviously, I think it's more of a deal where they're like, okay, we're up against it this year. We're not very good, and we might as well make a change and see if we can bring this young guy along. With in the other cases, Cooper Rush three and zero. I think there is officially a quarterback controversy don't in Dallas. Don't do that. Don't do official that. Official quarterback controversy in Dallas. Don't do that. Even Alex put his eyebrows up for that one because that's just a bullshit take. Although Jerry is going to do it. Jerry is going to convince himself that Cooper Rush is the guy, and Dak is going to be holding the clipboard at some point, and it's going to be the stupidest thing ever. Because hot take. Yeah, it's not a hot take. I mean, it's probably going to happen. It's not a hot take when it's Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones will do whatever he wants to do, including putting an ungodly amount of salt on an already salty breakfast sandwich like we saw in Hard Knocks in that one episode. But uh, Hot take, the next Dallas Cowboys quarterback to win a playoff game will be named Cooper Rush. No, it won't. There's no way. There is, there is no... I'm going to come out there. I want to put this on paper. This is on tape. The Dallas Cowboys will not win a playoff game this year if Cooper Rush is their quarterback. Like, that is just... I didn't say anything about about this year oh come on there's no way there's no let's move on we're not doing that right now <laughs> the pats of the pats nearly taking out rogers i tell you what I, the packers are they're not very good they find a way to win but they're not they're not very talented i'll tell you what their problem is is their coach got out coached by bill belichick that's what their problem is uh, if there was a list of coaches that got out coached by bill belichick it's a very long list. It is a very long list, but keep in mind the Packers have gone 13 and 3 the last two seasons with that guy at the helm and they've lost in the playoffs with really questionable decisions. They had zero business not covering that spread. It was nine and a half, and that was before Brian Hoyer got hurt with a head injury. And then you get the third string guy who literally looks like a guy who plays Mac Jones in a documentary about Alabama, and that guy almost wins the game for you. 
Hey, so I almost sent you this the other day. I, I came across, like, it might have been on, on TikTok. That's where I get all my news from. <laughs> Colin Cowherd was like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if you wanted to leave a franchise just in the dirt, and he was referring to Belichick, he's like, you trade away the franchise quarterback. You basically overspend in free agency. You overdraft a not great quarterback. I mean, there was like a list of eight or nine things where you're like, well, he goes, you basically, you let all your coaches go fail as head coaches at other places and bring them back. So now you have no heir apparent because you've seen all these guys leave and go fail elsewhere. So you have no faith in them. <laughs> and we hire them back here. So there's no heir apparent. I mean, it was like this conspiracy of like how Belichick could possibly be just trying to fuck the Patriots. Yeah, but to what end though? Like what to what end? It's not as if something happened and they that he got screwed. I mean, Bob Kraft did side with Brady, but they won another Super Bowl out of it. So at the end of the day, I can see how Cowherd would make that, but it's really just for content, and that's why you're bringing it up here, just like your stupid Cooper Rush take. It's all about the content here. You're just trying to you get listeners here to say the hot take thing. Don't don't turn into other people who make hot takes. Just don't do it, okay? I do have a hot take for you. I think the Broncos are the worst team in the league. Well, we're going to find out this week because there's going to be a contest of two teams in hot contention for being the worst team in the league, and that's my team, the Colts. I mean, granted, they snuck by the Chiefs, but uh, they've been very unimpressive so far. And I don't know, maybe this is the game the Broncos finally break out, but I could see this game being like a, it, it's going to be another abysmal offensive output. It'll be like 10 to 9, <laughs> something stupid like that. Getting ahead of yourself, coach. Just calm yourself down. But the Broncos just lost to the winless Raiders, who we said were, were maybe the worst team in the league. So it's just inexplicable. Like, it's inexplicable that the Broncos are 1-3 and three and they have looked this horrible. Let's go to college. A lot of fun stuff here. So UCLA is somehow 5-0. and oh. They have had maybe 50 people watch their games this season at home. Is Chip Kelly back? Chip Kelly's a good football coach. Um, I, I knew it was going to take him a little while to get the ball rolling at UCLA, but I'm not super surprised with this. And, you know, this week's a big game. It's going to be a pivotal game for both programs because they play Utah, which we'll, we'll hash into later as far as how that game's going to go. But this could be Utah's, like, get back in it sort of game, a springboard to, like, get their season back on track after, you know, maybe erase that blemish of the bad loss in Florida. Or this could be the game that really asserts UCLA as being for real. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing to, to see them at 5-0. and I've not even thought of them as relevant for a while. Uh, also, Lane Kiffin and your boys, Ole Miss, pretty much roll over Kentucky. They take care of business. They're in the top 10 now. That was a pretty good win for you. You must have felt good about that. Yeah, it was a good win. I tell you what, though, it was an ugly game. I watched m most of it, and one thing I was impressed with is Kentucky special teams. Now, it helped them and hurt them. They had they had a couple uh, snafus. They missed a couple PATs, um, things like that. But they, they had a guy, and I wish I could recall his name. They got a guy that returns kicks for him, and he returned two or three, at least beyond the opponent's 20-yard line. He may have returned one for a touchdown. I think he had a couple good punt returns. I mean, he was dynamic. It changed the game. It's probably the only thing that kept the game as close as it was is his uh, playmaking in you know the special teams game, and I, I kept being shocked that they kept kicking it to him whatever squib it kick the ball in the damn ground quit kicking the ball to this guy because he's killing you every time i'm continue to not be shocked that you can't remember these people's names so there is that as well by the way speaking of your boy what's his name then what's his name then smarty why pants? would i know you're the one who brought him up i don't need to know his name you're the one who brought him up go ahead alex Fair say enough. something say something deprecating to brad go ahead do it i know you want to yeah, that's right. Yeah, coming in hot. Show. <laughs> All right. By the way, speaking of your boy, Mike Leach, huge win. Probably one of the biggest wins he's had. Taking out your other boy, Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo's got to be on the hot seat. Jimbo's absolutely on the hot seat. He should have been on the hot seat by now. I, I love seeing Mike Leach get this win. And it's frustrating because the, he beats teams like this, and then he will lose to, like, Auburn. Mm-hmm. And I know Auburn's traditionally good, but this year they're not good. Nope. Or he'll win this game and lose to Missouri or something. That's what's so damn frustrating. I was so happy to see it, though. He gave a little wedding advice after the game, which is always good to see. Love seeing Jimbo 
on the hot seat. And, you know, this week, it's funny how far Arkansas fell after a loss to Alabama. Like, Mm -hmm. they just, like, plummeted out of the rankings, which (laughs) seems wild. Well, two losses in a row, and they got absolutely creamed. Like, there was no competition There's, I mean, I'm surprised, though, because usually these SEC teams get the benefit of the doubt a little bit. And But, hey, you know, Starkville, Arkansas, Mississippi State, we'll see how it goes this weekend definitely on the list of places that i never want to accidentally find myself starkville mississippi sounds terrible bring your cowbell speaking of possible terrible locations anywhere in kansas so kansas and kansas state both win and are both ranked in the rankings for the first time since 2007 when alex was two years old i think it's super fascinating that they're both ranked but tcu is going to lawrence to take on the jayhawks i think this is where the cinderella story ends and then you have Kansas State going to Iowa State. Iowa State's no slouch, but Kansas State, I think, is definitely probably the better team in the state of Kansas. I'm happy to be proven wrong. I have been many times, but you know, TCU just knocked off what Oklahoma pretty convincingly. Oh God, it was terrible. <laughs> and and uh, again, Kansas State going to Iowa State. I like Matt Campbell. You know, he's going to be probably one of the front runners for the Nebraska job. But yeah, I yeah, take that how you will. <laughs> but uh, I, I like the Wildcats in Ames. Speaking of other teams you like, Oklahoma State, big win over Baylor, which means they are ripe for the pickings here to be outside looking in when the playoffs are, are done. Yeah, they host Texas Tech. Texas Tech just beat Texas, yes. right, two weeks ago. I, I love how I have to confirm that just to make sure I recalled it correctly. That's right. Longhorns are back, folks. No, I'm just saying the Cowboys, I do like the Cowboys, man. I like Mike Gundy. I'm a man. I'm 40. <laughs> and now we're 4-0. and Great. Oh, that's still great. And speaking of coaches that are not men, Ohio State is still Bush League because they ran a fake punt up 39 points in a game against Rutgers. Fuck them. And now we have reached... The, you know, one of the fun things that we started doing, Brad, kind of, you mentioned a few of these games in here, and I'm going to not hold that against you because, you know, you've had a little bit of a tough road so far here in this episode, not remembering names, not knowing what's going on, but it is time for some new fun stuff. That sound means it is time for crunch time, the rapid fire rat-a-tat-tat. We are going to be going over 10 games today, and we are going to go tit for tat. And I really just giggle every time I I hear that because it just sounds so ridiculous. But we are going to start in the Big Ten, Nebraska traveling to Rutgers. I like Rutgers here because I just think Nebraska is a joke. Get over yourself. Rutgers is still Rutgers. I, I get Nebraska has been a little on a bit of a rough run here, but I will take Nebraska over Rutgers. Scarlet Knights. Number eight, Tennessee travels to number 25, LSU. Brian Kelly somehow has snuck right into the rankings again. It's a tough place to play, but you know what? Tennessee is going to take this one because I think Hendon Hooker just has too much for that LSU defense. I agree. Fire up the band. Let's play some Rocky Top. BK can eat a fat one. Number 17, TCU travels to number 19, Kansas. We already kind of talked about this. I like TCU coming off a huge win over Oklahoma. Kansas has been a great story, but I just think that it's it ends here. Yeah, will there be some hangover here after a big win? I don't know, but I honestly I don't anticipate that. I think that TCU walks in and shows Kansas what it's like to play a real football team. Give me the Horn Frogs convincingly. <laughs> Number 11, Utah, the former sexy pick for the playoff, travels to number 18, UCLA, in a game in which UCLA is now back on the national map. It's a road game for Utah. They already lost a big road game to Florida. I actually like the Utes here. Give me Chip Kelly and the Bruins in front of 400 fans at the Rose Bowl. Number five, Texas traveling to Oklahoma in a game of non-ranked teams, but it is a traditionally loved matchup. I actually like Texas here because Oklahoma has looked like dog shit for the last two weeks. Yeah, Red River rivalry. I I do like Texas kind of getting things back on track after taking that loss a couple weeks ago. Oklahoma has not looked great. I expected some more out of their defense with Brett Venables. Give me the horns. Switching to the NFL, Thursday Night Football, Colts travel to the Broncos in what has to be the shit fest of the week. I actually like the Broncos here because I think that the Colts traveling to Denver is just a little bit too much. Yeah, Denver's a tough place to play, and I think that the Broncos are eventually going to figure it out, and I predict this is the week it happens. 
Teddy Two Gloves and the Miami Dolphins travel to the Meadowlands to face Zach Wilson, Milf Hunter, and the New York Jets. I actually like the Jets here coming off a big win over the Steelers. Matty Eyes, I love you, buddy. I'm with you here. I think that losing Tua and just there's had to be some controversy with everything surrounding the team. Honestly, this is... Mike McDaniel's biggest challenge is keeping this team focused with all this stuff going on. I'll take the Jets. Zach Wilson lurking around the Brady compound with Giselle about to be on the market. Philadelphia Eagles travel to the Arizona Cardinals and the Flying Cliff Kingsburys. The Eagles have looked really, really good. The Cardinals have been kind of iffy. It's a road game. Give me the Cardinals here with Kyler Murray showing off his stuff and letting Jalen Hurts know he's the Jalen Hurts now. Man, you keep taking on my hot takes, my big picks here. I was like hoping to take the Cardinals. I figure you're high on the Eagles. I agree, though. I think that, you know, it's a cross country road trip. I do think that, you know, that's a tough team to, to defend. Cliff Kingsbury, uh, he's pretty creative offensively. And give me the Cardinals. Cincinnati Bengals travel to Baltimore to face the Baltimore Ravens. Joey B and the Bengals coming off a two-game heater. I think they need to show the NFL that they are back and they are ready to contend again. I love Joey B and the Bengals on the road here. Yes, I agree again. I think that the Bengals are for real, and I think they sort of assert themselves right here in this matchup against the respected, talented, and well-coached Ravens. Give me the Bengals. And this last one goes to Alex. Theoretically, it's going to be the Phillies at the Cardinals in the wild card series. I like the Cardinals here. Alex, what do you think? So let's see. You have the Cardinals who are actually good enough to win their own division. You have the Phillies who barely squeaked by with that consolation prize as the third wild card spot. I think the Phillies, they have some good starters that are going to go in this uh, game here, man. They're going to go with Aaron. They have some classically good aces like Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler, but they have a weak bullpen. They have a very one dimensional offense with the power hitters. And I think that they don't have, they don't swing the bat very well. They don't have a, good, a lot of good contact. They don't bunt. They don't move the ball around. St. Louis has uh, admittedly some worse starters out there, but they have more dynamic offense. They move the ball all over the place. Paul Goldschmidt's winning the MVP, so he's going to be the big catalyst there same thing with Arenado and Pujols in October he's just special in October so I think that St. Louis is really gonna show him what's up all right and that is crunch time for the week we got through them all Alex I appreciate you being game for that uh who do you like Get in touch with us on Twitter at Drippin' Sports is the handle. You can find me at Matty Ice Freights, or you can try to get in touch with Brad at Pub Time Podcast. Anyway, we have now reached another point in time where it is time for the of the week part of this week. We're going to start off with the Iceman's stat of the week. So, gentlemen, last week, the Detroit Lions lost to the Minnesota Vikings, Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings. Now, a fine was levied because Lions running back, Brad's Lions running back, Jamal Williams, was fined $13,000 for excessive sexiness or conduct or whatever you want to call it after a celebration in the end zone. Now, he was paying homage to a Key and Peele skit, and basically it's three pumps. Well, he did four pumps. So basically he got fined $3,300 per hip pump. So congratulations to him. And I also have another stat that according to Pro Football Focus, Nebraska last week had just six missed tackles. However, coming into the game, they had been averaging 14 missed tackles per game. That is horrible. Huskers rising. Yep, they're playing really well. And speaking of rising, we have coaches pick of the week. And the graphic is up here. And I do have a little something for you, Brad, after going now one and three with your Iowa Hawkeyes losing to the Michigan Wolverines. All right, sir, it is time for your pick of the week. Let our listeners know who you like and why you like them. <clears throat> Hear ye. Hear ye, come one, come all, to Coach's Pick of the Week. This week, I have a little local flavor. The Bears are traveling to play the Minnesota Vikings, and they are seven-point underdogs. I feel like the Bears are so bad that they buddy a game up enough to keep it close. Give me the Bears, plus seven, on the road against Minnesota. So let it be written, so let it be done. Bears over the Vikings, and that concludes this week's show. 
Alex, we really appreciated having you on, buddy, and uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself. So you're welcome back anytime to talk playoff baseball or just listen to us shoot the shit. But thanks for being a good sport and uh, get in with our self-deprecating humor or my self-deprecating humor. Yeah, it was uh, it's really fun uh, being able to talk a little baseball. I Brad knows as well as anybody that I'll talk to anyone who will listen about baseball. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm glad I was able to be on. Well, at least two people are listening and that's me and the ice man mm-hmm. it, it, it's nice though it's nice to bring a little variety to the show we we dabbled in baseball a little bit last week did a little bit of a deep dive this week hopefully we, we didn't put anyone to sleep with our analytics talk no i mean i, I honestly all i care about is that we're all fascinated and interested by it a, a kind of a great added perspective to bring to things so that was fantastic and looking forward to another exciting weekend in sports yeah this nfl week is absolutely terrible looking at it on paper like some of the matchups are just abysmal and the fact that you had to stretch and pick the bears for your pick of the week lets us know that it's going to be a red zone kind of weekend folks not that it isn't already but there are some games that are made for prime time and there are some games that are made for red zone and boy oh boy thursday night football couldn't be more ready for red zone but unfortunately, we're going to get it on Jeff Bezos Prime. So, uh, Brad, any more <laughs> any, any more closing thoughts before we get everybody out of here? Uh, no, nothing profound. Uh, just excited. I think that the college football picture is going to keep sort of clearing itself up as we go. I, the NFL is one of those things. It's, it's, it's ever evolving, ever evolving, just because there's so much parity and things could change on a dime. Uh, other than that, I'm just excited to be uh, able to watch it. And I just want to remind everybody, Pub Time Podcast, lend your support there. They're doing a lot of stuff right now. And Halloween season, they're doing some serial killer stuff. And that is some really fun stuff. If that is in your wheelhouse or that is your jam, please check out MattySmedia.com to support all the other podcasts that we have. If you are listening now, subscribe, rate, and review, all that stuff. It means a lot to us, and we like giving content to you, but we also like to know that you're enjoying it and that you're connected to it. So until next week, everybody, this is Drippin' Sports. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice and Brad are those of Matt, Brad, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice and Brad is exclusively owned by Matt and Brad and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.